Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for allowing us to be here in your house as we gather to study from Leviticus 19 and the chronological study of our time together on Wednesdays. We pray that you will bless this time, speak through your word, and give us reason to pursue holiness in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, you'll notice that if you've been following along in your bulletins, you'll notice that you should be in numbers 4, 5, 6, 7, something like that. Um, another kind of the pre to this recording or the pre to the live streaming, I, I, I was talking with you about some of the uh, other options that we have uh, maybe out there. And uh, as far as service schedules and times and, and materials and so on and so forth, teachings. And I got, um, I got really bothered by the fact that I had you reading uh, Leviticus 18 to Numbers, whatever it was, 6 or 5 or 6. Because when you go through that portion of Scripture, you're covering so much that I just can't possibly do it justice. Now, in, in 30, 45 minutes. Now, I realize that most people don't read the readings. I, I, I'm not an idiot. Um, I was born at night, not last night. So I know that not everybody's doing the readings. But what I do want to encourage you is to, to do the readings, but we're going to slow down a lot. So coming up in your bulletin this week, you're going to actually see Sunday what we're going to do Wednesday. And then you will, it will be on you to read that instead of giving you a breakdown. Now, Jessica may still put a breakdown in there, depending on how she puts the, the stuff in there. But, but we are going to be going into Leviticus chapter 20 next week. So just to go ahead and let you know, you, instead of you having to read the whole uh, seven or eight chapters like we had, you're going to just be asked to familiarize yourself with Leviticus chapter 20. Now tonight in Leviticus chapter 19, I'm actually going to read most of this to you. I'm going to skip around a little bit, but I'm going to read most of this to you. Why? Because again, I'm assuming you haven't read it. And so I'm going to let you hear it or read it with me as we read it together. And we're going to go through and talk about a few things. The difference between the new kind of new way of doing Wednesday night and Sunday morning is Sunday morning I give you the one thing that I want you to remember, and that's supposed to take you throughout the week. So the one thing this Sunday that, you're gonna, that, that I'm going to give you is going to propel you in a, in a life of compassion, because we're starting a new series on compassion and ways to, to form compassionate lives. So I'm going to give you, and it's about prayer, the first one is. So I'm going to give you a, a one-liner that you're going to go home with, and you're going to look and learn Sunday about how prayer is, is your number one step that must be a part of your life if you're going to be a compassionate person. You've got to have prayer in your life. So that's going to be your take-home. But on Wednesdays, I'm going to give you multiple things, the little deeper teaching as we talked about. So we're going to go through a few different things here tonight. And we're in Leviticus chapter 19. If you'll recall, in Leviticus chapter 18, I had so much fun last week, if you missed it. I enjoyed preaching on the forbidden sexual practices of uh, the Levites. And, uh, and, and what we're hearing, what we're reading here in Leviticus, you may say, Leviticus is boring, it's a bunch of laws, it's a bunch of... Well, it, it can be if you don't read it in the, in the proper context. But the proper context or the proper understanding of Leviticus is that it is a book of laws for a holy life. And it's very specific to the Levites, the Levitical people, the priests. But when we get into chapter 20, or maybe it's 21, we will see that there are specific laws for the priests. Right now we're talking about specific laws for the entire tribe. Now, in chapter 19, there is a parallel to our life in the New Testament. The parallel to our life in the New Testament church is that we are to pursue holiness, not because we are commanded as they were in this period of time, but because we have Christ in us and we are, there's, there's already, should be, if you're a Christian, an innate desire to be more like Christ, to pursue holiness or to pursue godliness. Pursuing holiness is not an arrogance. We're not pursuing piety. We're pursuing a life that is as closely uh, ma as closely exemplified or that closely exemplifies the, the person of Jesus Christ. So in other words, I may never be able to be 100% like the person of Christ, but I want to be as close as I can. And so chasing godliness, pursuing godliness, or pursuing holiness is another way of saying I'm chasing after the goal of being as much like the Christ as I can possibly be. Do you understand that? 
So I ask you this question to start off. Where are you in your pursuit of holiness? Uh, you know, we, we talked earlier before, the, before we began, we talked a little bit about people uh, not having time to spend all day in the Word. Well, I don't either have all day to spend in the Word. Believe it or not, as a, as a vocational pastor, I do a lot more than just studying the Word. But I have to carve out time in my calendar to be in the Word studying for the purpose of growing, not just preaching, but growing, and I have the luxury of doing that. You don't have the luxury of doing that if you have a full-time job, or maybe you don't have the luxury of doing that. But if you're not reading anything, then you're missing the boat. If you're not studying at all, or praying at all, or reading God's Word at all, or looking to devotion at all, then you're not even trying. And so, while nobody expects you to go in and put in eight hours at work tomorrow, and seven of those hours be Bible study, what you do, and maybe not even one of those hours, maybe all eight of those hours at work, you have to be running nonstop at work. You get home, you're tired, you don't have time, but here's what you've got to do. If it's important to you, You'll find a way to do it. You'll find time to do it. And you live in 2018 where if you don't know how to use the technology, somebody will help you. But you can get audio books. You can get dramatic audio Bibles. You can get stuff in your email, on your phone. There's so many ways to grow and put a little bit of that in your life if you're willing to do it. So are you willing to pursue holiness? Well, tonight hopefully you are. And tonight we'll look at some of these points in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, it starts out like this, and then I'm going to jump down after starting off. The Lord also said to Moses, give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Stop. People say the Old Testament is to be seen as a historical book that shows me the old covenant of Israel that God made with his people. That's true. Well, pastor, then should I live according to the Old Testament? Yes, if the Old Testament is fulfilled through the New Testament. What does that mean? It means if it fulfills one of these laws or one of these things that Jesus said. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And go and make disciples of all the nations. If baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey my commands and know I'm with you to the very end. Let me finish the verse. If your Seeing something in the Old Testament that can be categorized by one of those New Testament teachings that Jesus gave in response to the Pharisees, then yeah, you should be living that way. Does that make sense? So so let's go down to verse 19. Because people ask, well, it's the Old Testament. Well, hold on. There are some things that we will see are not necessary for today. Chapter 19, let's go to verse 9. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your field and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strive every last or do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners, do not foreigners living among you. I'm Lord your God. Okay, so what I find interesting about that is that I am neither a farmer of grain or a farmer of grapes. So that must not apply to me, Ed, because I am not a farmer, nor have I ever been a farmer, and I do not believe I shall ever be a farmer. Right? I do. Thank you. I, I, thought, I didn't know what I thought. I really don't know what I thought you were doing there. Uh, <laughs> I do know what I thought you were doing. I couldn't believe you were doing it. The... Uh, <laughs> And for all of you out there, it looked like he was doing this. I just want, you know, thought he was making fun of me. Um, for those of you listening on the app, we're not telling you what it looked like. Um, but anyway, so I'm not going to be a farmer. So I could look at that verse and kind of gloss over it and say, well, it, it must not mean anything to me. There must not be any teaching there for me. And when you read the Old Testament, you have to be careful of glossing over these things because you will think none of it applies to me. But there is actually an application for every one of us that are Christians in that verse 9 and 10, those verses. And if we're not careful, we'll miss it. So what is the lesson? Well, the lesson is that we can easily forget those who are less fortunate than us. 
See, the context there was that God was telling them to be good to their foreigners. In other words, and and the poor, and the people less than them, by leaving the outskirts of the harvest land unharvested so that the poor could come along and eat of that. It was not about uh, a specific, some weird thing God wanted to do for the people of Israel and control them. God was teaching them to be generous. And he's teaching us to be generous through this scripture. So the question for you is, and, and this is actually in, your, in this Bible, uh, it actually comes up in one of the footnotes, but I put it as a text question. In what ways can you leave the edges of your field unharvested? That's the question you need to ask. As you go out tonight or to eat at a restaurant or you go tomorrow to eat somewhere or you go to work tomorrow or you go to the store, ask yourself, How God, in fact, ask God, he's got the answer if you don't. How can I leave the edges of my field unharvested? In other words, what of the abundant blessing that I have could I use the outskirts of to bless someone less fortunate? Imagine if for a moment you adopted a policy and your policy was, I'm always, no matter how bad the service is, going to tip 20%. If that's your policy, stick to it and always tip 20%, no matter what. Because you don't know that your service wasn't bad because of that waiter or waitress having a bad day. They might have been evicted from their home and they left their house that day knowing that they had nowhere to go at 9 o'clock when they got off that night and they were hoping that they were going to be able to have somewhere to stay because they had to be at work at 7 the next day. You, You don't know what they're going through. So the bad attitude that they have or the poor service they gave, God's grace through your generosity may be the grace that they need at that moment. You see what I'm saying? How can you use the outer edges of your harvest field, the unharvested edges, to bless others? You might say, every time I go to the store and I see somebody who needs something and they're begging for money, I'm always going to buy them $10 worth of groceries. That might be your policy. If your budget can afford to increase your amount, potentially 10 bucks every time, That's the outer edges of your unharvested field. It might be that every time you hear of a child who needs food, you are willing to buy a weekend's worth of food for that family. Is that the outer edges of your harvest? Let, let Let me put it to you this way. If my field is abundant and God is blessing me, can I afford to take the outer edges of the harvest and leave it for the poor, God says, you bet you can. Don't build another silo. Don't build another silo. That's right. That's right. So what do we do? I'll give you, I'll cast this vision. Finance folks, uh, you might panic a little bit. I'm not saying we'll do this. I'm just casting a vision uh, to ask you to do this later on in in our many years later. Uh, I have a desire that we have two goals. If we meet these two goals, this is my pitch. I've had this from the beginning of being here. The the first goal is that we meet the budget without having to adjust the budget negatively. In other words, we don't have to stop spending. We've met the budget. Okay, We haven't done that yet since I got here, so I'm waiting for that goal. But Lord willing, it'll happen one day. The other one, though, is that at the end of that year, having met that budget, we also end up in a surplus. So in other words, if our budget is $135,000, we will have taken in at least $135,000 and at the end of the year have not spent any less than what we brought in. Everybody with me on that? Make sense? So let's say we had a surplus in our budget and in our spending of $5,000. A lot of churches will take that $5,000, stick it in the bank and call it a year. I'd like to take the surplus and give it to someone. Why? Because the principle of the outer edge is the harvest. Now, I want to make sure we're taking care of our family at home. I'm I'm what you would call a populist. I believe in taking care of America first. So I believe that God's teaching we need to feed our family from the field, but the outer edges that are not going to be necessary for us should go to the poor. And in this situation, whatever that extra is from the church, I will be pushing when that time comes for the church to give that money to 
uh, ministries, not necessarily walk out and hand somebody cash, but give ministry money, help schools, help whatever, so that at the end of the year, we, we end up in a zero break-even point, and we start back the next year with the same goal in mind. Now, why? Because of the teaching of the harvest field. Now, we're not going to go into it and read it. Did you have to go to the store for that? Thank you, brother. We're not going to... <laughs> you just no, we're out of them in the fridge. You just made a good uh, you you just missed a great illustration. You have to go back and listen to it. <laughs> um, especially being finance chairman, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how good it is then, won't we? Uh, now in verses ten through thirty five, there's a lot of do nots in here. We're not going to read the do nots because of time. Uh, but I do want you to, because uh, I know you'll go through and read it this week, I do want you to recognize that when people say, well, out of book, the Bible's a whole bunch of do-nots. Actually, it's a whole bunch of do's. It's a whole bunch of get-to's. In Matthew uh, 24, 22 rather, 34, excuse me, through 40, that's the verse that the do-nots are summed up by Jesus who says, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, Jesus basically summed up all of the do-nots. I'll read a couple of them for you. Uh, Verse 10 is where it starts, I believe. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Verse 11, I'm sorry. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not bring shame on the name of your God by using it to square falsely. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear God. Fear your God. I'm the Lord. Okay. Basically, anything in this part that says do not is covered by do love God. And love your neighbor. That's why at Smith Street Baptist Church, we are loving God, loving people, and making disciples. It's because all of what we are supposed to do is summed up in loving God, loving people, and making disciples. I still think that's really awesome. I don't know how many people at Smith Street Baptist Church really realize, but I, because I didn't do a very good job of casting this in the first couple of years, but I am now at the point where I'm talking about it so much that I get tired of hearing it myself, which means I must be talking about it a lot. Loving God, loving people, and making disciples. What is this church all about? It's about loving God, loving people, and making disciples. You can break that, extrapolate it, make it into a big old paradigm, and I got it for you, and I got graphics and charts that will go along with you, and some of you have been to Pastor's Breakfast, and you've seen them. But the fact of the matter is, it all comes down to loving God, loving people, and making disciples. So the Ten Commandments, the laws in Leviticus for the, for the tribe of Levi, all of these things come down. That's why he said all of the law and all of the prophets hinge upon that. It means that everything sums up into love God, love others. And then the purpose or mission is to make disciples. You understand? If you act like a jerk to somebody, you ain't loving God or people. Well, they acted like a jerk to me first. Yeah, but you got the power of the living Christ in you. Are you going to rise up over that or are you going to get down on their level? And, and hey, I'm first to tell you, sometimes I get down on that level. And I shouldn't. Heather come in and say, you're arguing with people on Facebook again, aren't you? Sometimes I just need to shut my mouth and go home. But you know, we're all, we're all working. We're all walking through this life together. But the fact is, we need to call a spade a spade. I'd much rather you come up to me, not you, but anybody else, come up to me and say, uh, Preacher, I, you know, brother, I, I, don't, I don't really like uh, having to tell you this, but uh, you know, when you, uh, when you told that person they were a big bunch of ugly stupidness, uh, you weren't really loving God or people there. You know what, I'm man, I don't want to hear that, but you know what, if I do it, I need to hear it. Amen. I need to hear it. I'm not going to get all offended. Well, I might. But I'll get over it because I need to hear it. Some of y'all need to hear it, amen? <laughs> Leviticus 19.27 says, ter- uh, talks about, and we, then we're going to talk about 19.28. Some of y'all got some tattoos, we're going to talk about that. And then some of y'all going to hear this and you'll run out and get some more, I guarantee you. <clears throat> Live in holiness, personal conduct. Uh, verse 20, uh, let's go down 28. Do not cut your bodies for the dead and do not mark your skins. I'm sorry, verse 27. Do not trim off the hair of your temples or trim your beards. Do not cut your bodies for the dead and do not mark your skin with tattoos. Okay, so this is not just for the Levite priest, yet we're not there yet. So this is still for the whole tribe of Levi. Now, before y'all get all uppity, let me tell you something about this. Okay? 
unless I'm missing it, and I very well could be, because while you know 2% of the Bible, I know 1%. So I may be absolutely wrong here, but I don't know of anywhere else in Scripture that it talks about tattoos. I do know it talks about it here. In fact, one time I was working at uh, Serenity Hospice, and this lady who worked in the front office at the hospice, she came up to me, and, and I was in my office, which was shared with four or five other people, and I was sitting at my desk, and she said, Chester, let me ask you a question. What is the uh, best verse, uh, best Bible verse to get tattooed on my, on my side right here? And I said, Leviticus uh, chapter 19, 29, 28, whatever that was. And she, she went back, she said, thank you. And, and she goes back, and, and she goes and looks it up, and she comes back, oh, that's real funny, Chester, that's real funny. You know, I said, I said hey, if you're going to do it, get that one, all right? I mean, if you're going to do it, get that one. Let me tell you the, the understanding of this, though. Let me, let me help you understand this. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm going to just be honest with you. You don't have to like, you don't have to agree with me on this. This is personal opinion. One of the things I preached when I first got here was the difference between biblical mandate and personal preference. Personal preference is what I like. Biblical mandate is what God likes. Okay? I'm not, I'm not a fan of tattoos. If you roll up here and you got your Superman tattoo and you think you are the baddest thing in town, and you're like, check it out, man. I'm going to withhold my judgment, but I think it looks silly. Now, it may be the coolest thing. I mean, you might like it. And I'm going to tell you something. You are no better or no worse for liking your tattoo. And I am no right or no wronger, more right or more wrong, for not liking it. The fact of the matter is because I'm not caring for it does not make you better or worse. So don't even think about it. There's no judgment there. I just don't happen to be a fan of them. At the same time, I don't lose any sleep over people getting them. Because the scriptures here are not talking about this to us in the New Testament life. They're talking very specifically about pagan worshiping the dead. They're talking about the the suffering and the sorrow and the life with no hope. Now I would tell you this, and this may stretch it a little bit, but I'll tell you this. If if you and people do this, I I know I know people do this, and that's fine. Whatever. Again, their liberty in Christ. I think it's Romans 14, they between them and Jesus. But if you get a tattoo of somebody on you, and maybe you do have some, I run the risk of offending you, and I hope I don't, but if you get the tattoo of a name and a loved one who's died on you, that's probably as close to that scripture as you're going to get. Because what they did was they marked it in honor of the dead in a, for, in a way of, of, of almost idol worship of the dead, and they became very sorrowful and had no hope. And here's the thing. We as Christians, we have hope. In Christ. So we don't have to walk around as if we have no hope. And remember, God was warning through Moses the Israelites about going into Canaan where the pagans were living and doing all these horrible things we read about in the chapter before. So God is saying, don't go in and do these things like these people. In other words, don't go in there and live as if you have no hope because you have hope. You have hope in me. Eventually, you have hope in a risen Savior of the future. We have hope in the risen Savior of the past but and the present. But they they had hope in God and and, and the coming Messiah. And so, if somebody says, you're going to go to hell because you got a tattoo, they are as true as when they say, you're going to go to hell because you ran a red light. See, the Bible doesn't teach that, my friends. And we need to know that. Now, you need to be grown up enough that if your grandchild comes in and says, you like my new tattoo? You can say, not on you. (laughs) Or maybe you do like it. And that's your choice. Andrew's 13 years old. He wants a tattoo. He keeps saying when he turns 18, he's going to get a tattoo. I'm going to tell you something. If he walks in the house with a tattoo, we're going to love him just as much as we did when he walked out before he got it. But there's one thing I will not do, and that's pay for it. I got family members got tattoos. If you want to get a little decoration on your arm, that ain't my business. That is not my business. And you're not going to stay out of heaven for it. You may lose a job because of it. You may not get hired because of it. Some of y'all, I got a family member has got one of them sleeve tattoos goes all the way down her arm. I don't know how many times she expects to go out in her professional job with that arm uncovered, but I'll bet it won't be often. But that's her choice. Right? Doesn't hurt me. And God didn't say don't. So understand that 
the scriptures. Now, if my wife came home and she said, I got a tattoo, I would I would say, honey, I think you're crazy. But I love you. I love you. Now, if she came home and had a tattoo of some guy named, you know, Bart or something on her arm, then I might have a problem with it. So don't go getting Bart's name on. Okay, just to be clear. Roseanne looked like, what? Bart? She's been dating Jody. <laughs> Leviticus 19.32. Some of y'all older people are going to like this verse. Leviticus 19.32 says, Stand up in the presence of the elderly and show respect for the aged. Uh, I just want to point out that's Old Testament. Let's move on. <laughs> no. Fact of the matter is, our elderly are often overlooked. And uh, that happens especially when they can't get out of their homes and can't do stuff. Uh, and, and that's something that I have had to deal with in my own walk, in my ministry, that I have, I have been guilty of because I stay so focused and running so much that if somebody doesn't remind me, that's why I have a board in my office with all of our shut-ins and, and hospital and hurt folks on my board so that every time I'm in that office, every day I can see those names. And not only does it remind me to pray for them, but it reminds me to see how they're doing. And I still probably don't do as well as I could because I haven't arrived at perfection. But what this is talking about is this is a warning for us today. It was a warning then. It's a warning for us today to not forget. Now, let me, let me just put this out. Not forget the older folks. Now, let me just tell you something. Uh, can I just say this? A lot of pastors don't get to say the things I get to say. You know that? And I'm thankful for y'all. Uh, just because you're older and have been around longer does not make you smarter or wiser. It makes you more experienced in life. In fact, it makes you better at not dying than me. Right? That's what it makes you. But just because I'm a young whippersnapper doesn't mean I know everything either. In fact, I probably could learn a lot from you. The fact is, the Bible teaches iron sharpens iron. So the olders can learn from the youngers, and the youngers can from the, learn from the olders if both of them are humble. Isn't that right? You know, churches that have problems with, we don't connect to the youngers, we don't connect to the olders. Let me tell you something. That's pride and excuse making. You want to connect to them? Go introduce yourself. Take them out to lunch. Take them out to dinner. There's a whole lot of grandmas and grandpas would love to love on some little kids, and there's a whole lot of little kids need some love on some grandma and grandpas because they don't have them. There's a whole lot of teenagers need some old folks to put their arms around them, hug on them, and there's a whole lot of old folks need some teenagers to hug them back. That's just a bunch of baloney excuse making that we do. We are all, as long as we're living here, doesn't matter how old we are, we are all. God's children. And God loves us and he has a plan for us and we need to embrace that. And, and, and that's been, as a young preacher like Timothy, which Timothy was a lot younger than I am uh, when, when he was, uh, became a preacher. But, you know, when you think about Timothy, uh, in I think it's 2 Timothy 4.12, he's warned of being, not letting his, his youthfulness be uh, something that gets in the way of his ministry. And I remember the first time I went to Pastor Austin Baptist Church, and I had about 25 people, and most of them were uh, on up there. And I mean, not old, old, but most of them were, you know, 60s, 70s. And, and I was 25 years old, and I remember thinking, these people have been saved, some of them, longer than I've been alive. How am I going to preach anything to them? And God, God just laid on my heart, you're not. I am. I've been around longer than they have. Don't worry about it. Amen. Uh, it amazes me when a church of older folks will call a younger pastor and then not... Listen to his leadership and advice. I think, well, why'd you call him? You thought because he was young, all these young people were going to follow him over there? When's that work? He's not the Pied Piper. You know, going through town, playing his little flute, and all of the young folks follow him like rats down the highway. I mean, that's not how it works. We're all in this together. Those of us who have gray hair and those of us who have a few gray hairs. And I'm starting to get a few of them, early. I know, it happens. I got put on Lasix today. Now I really feel old. Yeah, I know, right? Lasix. Come on now. It's all that water I'm drinking. I called Medicaid, wouldn't pay for it. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 talks about aliens and then we're done. Not aliens. I believe in aliens, y'all. I'm just going to let you know that. I believe there's little aliens up in space. I do. Ed looked at me. Ed, I met some of your family. You know I believe in aliens. But alien in the scripture was a, uh, some of y'all are like, does he really? I'm not going to tell you. Aliens uh, in the scriptures here was often a foreign merchant, craftsman, or mercenary. Obviously, we talk about aliens kind of like we do here today, illegal aliens, people from other countries or outsiders. 
And one of the things that we need to do, and, and I'm going to leave you with this thought within a few minutes here because I could have gone a lot longer on this, but uh, I jotted down these questions. One of the questions I jotted down was, how are we to treat foreigners uh, as we would treat, how, how, how is it possible to treat foreigners as we would treat our fellow countrymen? Using some of the biblical terminology here. How would we, how would we treat a foreigner as we would a fellow countryman? Well, the answer is the same way, with love and grace. Uh, let, me, let me go on. How can we view strangers as opportunities to demonstrate God's love? With love and grace. Now that brings us to a socio, so, so, socio-political issue. And that is, what do we do with our borders? And I don't often get on a political stance, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and you can disagree, because guess what? You have a right to disagree with this. But I am a populist unapologetically. I believe in America first. It's kind of like I believe in Smith Street first. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm competing with all these other churches? No, it's mean God put me here. It means God put me here to pastor you who chose to come to Smith Street. I'm not really interested in what First Vidalia is doing or First Lions or the church across the street or the church down the road. Now, if we can partner with them to reach a community, I'm all about partnering with them. But somebody comes up and says, this church has this or that church does it that way or those churches over there do it this way. I tell them, let me tell you something. I'm up to my ears in how this church does it. I don't have time to worry about how those churches do it. Because my responsibility is to be focused on the God-fearing members and visitors and guests and whatever of Smith Street Baptist Church at 503 Smith Street. So when I leave here today, I will lock the doors of this church, but I will pass a number of churches going home. I will not lock their doors. I won't stop to check and see if they're locked. My responsibility will be to make sure the deacons have locked our church. (laughs) Right? It doesn't mean I don't want foreigners coming into our church it means i want them coming in the right way and the right way to come into this church and foreigner in that sense being anybody who's not already inside the church is to come in the church when the church is open for business if i left the doors unlocked how long before some of this equipment would be gone the same is to be said about our country We have veterans that are not taken care of in this country. And until we can take care of our veterans, we don't need to take care of other people's, other countries. If we are, we we have a country where we have students graduating from college with $40,000, $50,000, $60,000 of student loans and they can't get jobs to pay them. There's a problem. We have children sleeping on the streets because there's no place for them to stay in big cities, in the slums. That's a problem. We have children being sold into sex slavery in the biggest sex slavery market in Atlanta, Georgia, of the state, of the country, rather. That's a problem. And I know there's a lot of problems everywhere. And I know the world has a lot of problems that we need to pray for. And I'm all about sending humanitarian aid and support as much as we can as a church to help other ministries in other parts of the world. But when it comes to this country, at some point, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of other people. You know, that was one of the things I used to say as a hospice chaplain to caregivers when they were on the verge of burning out. We had something called respite care. Respite care is where we would take the loved one and put them in the hospice house for three to five days so that the loved one who was the caregiver could get back to taking care of themselves for a few days so that they would be healthy again because they were burning out and becoming overworked being a caregiver. And and the people would say, I don't want to send my loved one to to the hospice house for three or four days. I, I need to be there the whole time. And I would look at them as their chaplain and I would say, I get what you're saying, but if you don't take care of yourself and you die... Who's going to take care of them? Now, I would ask you that about this country. If we don't take care of ourselves and get ourselves on the right path, how in the world are we going to help some other country that's in a revolution of its own? We've got enough problems right here in our country, and we've got enough people not being taken care of that were born here, that are natural citizens, without opening our borders to everybody else. Now, you say, well, preacher, that seems kind of, that doesn't seem very compassionate. I'm not telling you not to pray for them. And I'm not telling you not to send your financial support to them. 
And I'm not telling you not to go over there and help them yourself if God's put that on your life. What I'm telling you is, tonight in Vidalia, in Vidalia, there will be people sleeping under park benches. There will be people sleeping in parks. There will be sleep, people sleeping in hotels because they have no place to go. They'll be sleeping in their cars. In little Vidalia. So go to Detroit. Go to Chicago. Go to Atlanta. And imagine what you're going to see there. There are parents tonight who will go to sleep in this country hoping that their daughters are dead instead of being raped. You think about that. And I not say that to, say to feel bad. I tell you that, that if we want to treat foreigners, aliens, that want to come over to this country the right way, the way we do is we set up a place for them to come through and a process for them to come in, and then we ask them to fulfill that process, and we welcome them with open arms once they've come through. And if it seems unfair to you that we can't funnel millions of people through Staten Island, guess what? Nothing says we had to. We're not being mean, hateful people. We're being responsible. You lock your doors at night, not to keep me out. You've probably never gone to bed worried about me coming into your house at night. But you lock your doors at night to keep those who might want to break in and hurt you or steal something. Y'all, there's a lot of good we can do in this country. And there's a lot of good we can do in our community. But we need to quit apologizing for being Americans. I didn't choose to be born here, but I'm glad I was. And I'm not going to apologize that other people don't have it as good as me because other people have it better than me. It's like silly for us to walk around and do that. And the scripture here is not teaching that we have to be open doors and let them take over and run us out of our home. I mean, if you still think that, ask yourself this. Are you willing to take all the homeless people in Vidalia tonight, put them in your house, and you sleep out in the park? If you're willing to do that tonight, I'll help you round them up. I'll help you get them to your house. And I'll shut my mouth and never say another word. But all of us are going to go home tonight and none of us are going to open up our doors and put the homeless in and put us on the street. So don't play high and mighty about the country because what you're not willing to do on your little corner of heaven on earth, your home, don't ask the country to do when we've got men and women who have given limbs, who have post-traumatic stress and have struggled to keep us free. And that's not a political statement. I could. I could make it one, but that's not. That is a biblical statement because I don't want you to do what people do and say, the Bible says you're supposed to love the foreigners. Nobody said we didn't. The fact of the matter is we just don't have enough room for them right now. And if we're going to take care of them generations from now and help them generations from now, we've got to clean up our, our mess.